DVD tutorial set. I'm Jason Van Gumster, and I'm going to be walking you through all of the cool stuff that is involved with Blender's Fluid Simulator. So what I have here to start with is your standard Blender setup. The only difference I really did is I'm using the default rounded theme. It's a little bit darker than the standard Blender theme, uh, and I, I kind of prefer it myself. First thing I'm going to do is we don't really need the object manipulator, so I'm going to turn that off and go from here. We need to go to your object buttons, which is shortcut F7. If you press F7 again, you'll go to the physics buttons. And that's where all of the fluid simulator controls live, right there in this tab. There are two things that are necessary for any fluid simulation. You need a domain for the fluids to live in, and you obviously need the fluid itself. Now, in order to set up a domain, we're going to set this cube up as our domain. Let me scale this up a little bit here so it works a little bit better just so we can see it. Um, bearing in mind, of course, that scaling in Blender actually doesn't influence the simulation at all. There are settings to relate that to the real world. So once we have our, our cube set in here, you hit Enable and Domain. Now, you can use other shapes as domains, but when the algorithm works, it's actually calculated as a cube. So uh, that's why we usually stick with that. The length of the real world size is the largest uh, length on your domain. But it actually does use the constraints of it if you were to use a rectangle or something else for the size. At any rate, we have our domain sitting in here. And these are our general settings in here. You have your standard settings, your advanced settings, and the boundary settings. And we'll get to each of these in time. The first thing we need to do now that we have our domain is actually add our fluid. So I'm going to put this in the top view and add an icosphere which is right there. With that in there, and I'm going to actually lift it up so we have some room for it to drop. Because that's the exciting part of all fluid simulations is making it look really cool when it falls down. Now, we have our domain, and this will be a fluid by simply clicking Enable Fluid. Because it's a closed surface, we can use the init as a volume. If this were, for instance, a a plane, we would have to use shell. Shells uh, use the exterior to create the surface uh, of the fluid, whereas the using volume, we actually use the entire entirety of the object as the uh, fluid itself. So now that we have our two objects here, our domain and our fluid, let's run a simulation. In order to do that, you need to do one small further step, and that's right here. This is the directory where you want to put in uh, baked fluids. The way Blender's Fluid Simulator works is it actually bakes the simulation to a series of meshes, which it stores on the hard drive. And this is where you pick where it goes. If you don't pick, it'll just go into the directory wherever uh, your existing blend file is. We actually want to pick a specific place for it, though. So I'm going to put it right here under this directory, and I'm going to call this chapter 1. Uh, zero 01 sim. Set that right in there. So now that that's our directory made, you just select directory and now you see that that's filled in here where we want the simulation to go. Now we can choose our resolution that we want to go with. Right now I'm going to stick with 50 and I'm going to um, you have two resolutions to actually work with here. You have your preview, your sorry, your render resolution, and you have your preview resolution. Using your preview resolution in here will give you a real-time preview of how things work in here. It's a really nice, nice setup for that, and you can adjust these either way you go. And then from here, when you display it, you can actually render or view the final or the preview setup, which is actually also very nice. The other thing I really need to do is I need to go into our render buttons here, which is shortcut F10, and set our distance. We're going to actually run this at 24 frames a second, and just for our own edification here, we're going to set this at 1280 by 720. And we're going to run this particular simulation for a total of 4 seconds, so 24 frames a second at 4 seconds is 96 frames. So now we have that set. And now to that, we have our end time, which we already said is going to be 4 seconds. So this is actually, again, 
scale and time are all built into the fluid simulator here. So what you want to do is the start time is going to be zero, the end time in this case is going to be four seconds. And of course that's how, that will relate it to the timeline, which I will actually break out another one of these here. Split the area and put a timeline in here. So we can actually scrub this when we want. So we have our our full time sequence here. Then all we have to do is actually hit bake. Now as it bakes, what's going to happen is you see that the domain object actually replaces the fluid object and falls down. And the fluid actually, the fluid object only really serves as a source. So what happens, what you need to do is when you're done simulating, you need to set this up and move this to a separate layer. And because it's at a low resolution, it looks like all the fluid's gone. So we're going to stop baking here because it's not really seeing a whole lot. Actually, let me get this to about 20 frames so I can show you something else. Because it's actually also baking and we're seeing the preview set up here. So if I were hit to escape to finish, to stop it in the middle of doing it, one, you can see it drop down and do its thing. If we put this in final, you see that the mesh is a little bit more dense. Let me put that in our shaded preview now. And you actually see it actually falls down and you see more of the mesh. And then it goes back to the original mesh that, that was set there. And like I was saying, these are the meshes that it creates, these uh, bob.j.gz files. These are the finals and these are the previews. It creates mesh for, a mesh for both, e both of these. So you can, again, if you view it in preview, you're going to see it pretty much disappear and give you problems. But if you view it in final, it actually works a whole lot better and you can actually see better of it. One of the other things you want to do, uh, typically you don't want to have faces on your on your fluid. So if you go into your edit buttons and hit set smooth, that'll take care of that problem for you pretty easily. And that, so now that falls down and it behaves properly. If you want to animate that, you hit Alt A. Uh, of course, it's going to go, and the later frames it'll go back to the box. But once it gets back to the beginning again, it falls down and does that. Now, you have your simple splat there, and we're working fairly happily on that. Now, if we want to go back into our settings here, we can actually increase our resolution slightly. Um, notice that when you increase the resolution, it actually increases the amount of required bake memory to run the simulation. And with that set. Actually, I'm going to set this a little bit lower to give us some a little bit faster baking times for for this tutorial. And I'm going to move our source object to a different layer. So, if you want to see it, it's there. If we don't, it's there. And now that we have that, we have our settings set and ready to go. I'm going to pull that back up so we can see it. Now we have some attributes we can do to, to modify and adjust on this. One of the one of the particular ones that's very helpful is the downward force that's on it. The domain itself actually already has a downward z force, which is your gravity in negative 9.81, which is real world settings. Uh, these here will also change your viscosity settings as well on this particular tab. This is also in the, in the standard tab. The viscosity settings are also based on real world calculation and numbers. So if you had a lookup table for liquid or fluid viscosities, um, those numbers actually plug in here and you can do a manual setting for the value in the exponent. We're going to stick with water for now. Um, you can also set the real world size of your domain. This is the, if you were to look at the domain itself, this setting corresponds to the length of an edge. On a cube, they're all the same size, so it doesn't matter. On a rectangle, it's the length of the longest edge of the domain in meters. So this is 0 0.03 meters uh, in real, real world size. If I wanted this water to drop at in a one meter domain, it's as simple as changing that to one, which we'll do for that. And then our boundary settings, you can actually set no slip or free. Um, and that's the stickiness of the actual domain itself because you noticed when it falls down and actually when it hits the edge of the domain it stops whether there's an obstacle there or not it stops at the end of the domain that's one of the side effects of the actual uh, fluid simulation algorithm that's used in this particular in blender no slip 
does as it says. There's, uh, it's pretty much sticky on the on the surface, and free of course is not sticky. And there are tracer particles and settings which you can throw in there, which we'll play with in a, in a few minutes. Now, let me just run a quick simulation to show you what happens when you increase the uh, resolution and the real world size. Simply have the domain selected and hit bake and what this will do is it will automatically overwrite all the simulations that were already set in here and you can watch it fall and run the simulation you see you can see the actual baking process happen at the top of the screen and it'll run through on which frame it currently is on and the cool thing is if you want to bake bake viewing in final that way you can see exactly what what's happening and if you have a problem with it you can hit escape and close out of it baking while in preview well it's helpful for playback baking in preview doesn't help you very much because it doesn't give you a real perception of what the rendering is so this is continues to bake we'll let this keep cooking on All right, now that our baking is completed and it's run through, we can actually scrub this on our timeline and you can run the animation back. Now, you can, that basically shows you the entire thing and you can actually, if you hit play, it'll run it back and you can change the view around while it sits there and festers on its own. So, once it gets back out over here, we'll see it fall down and splatter. Now of course this isn't giving us a real-time view of it because it's using the higher resolution meshes. If we were to hit escape here and set our display quality to preview, while it won't give us a better won't give us a good idea of what it will look like, it'll give us a pretty firm idea of the motion of it. Which you're not going to see there, but once it gets and it splatters out. And so you can get a better idea of the way it works without having to do a preview render. So, now that we have that set, I'm actually going to quit that out. We have our fluid coming in and doing a splat, but th that's not the only settings we can use. One of the other ones that's my personal favorite, actually, is to use it as an inflow object. So, the easiest way to do that is to take our object that was originally our fluid and just set that to be an inflow. With that being your inflow, this just means that fluid will constantly be, a, this will be a source of fluid. So, when you bake it, it'll, it'll come through here, and actually I'll show that to you right now. And we'll see it come through, and because this is our inflow object now, it actually stays there. It doesn't fall down um, like the fluid object would. It stays there as a source, and essentially just drips fluid right through and out. This works well for if you want to have a source for uh, a drippy faucet, or you want to have just a, a, a slow stream of liquid to come in. Now, if you want something more gushing, if you want more liquid to be coming in, there's an easy way to fix that, and I'll escape out of this current baking pass to solve that. What you can do is go through in here, take our inflow object, and play with our inflow velocities. We're going along the z-axis here, so if you just simply set this to be in a negative value, say we put it at negative 0.5, because our real world size is at one meter, um, giving it, you don't have to give it too large of a value to actually have, have it make an influence on it. So we have that set, then it's a simple matter of taking our fluid object, our domain object, and baking it again. And now you'll be able to see it actually pulls itself down and gives us gives us more of a pushing feel there. And this is better for something along the lines of, for instance, a water faucet or uh, any other sort of cohesive filling unit that you want to have come in. I'm going to pause again while this finishes baking and then we'll play with some of the particle settings on here. Okay, now that our fluid simulation has been baked, you can actually pull this back and play it back. You can actually see it start to fill in. 
it performs just like an inflow should. It fills in the space and as you can see it fills in the area of the domain. One of the other things if you've been baking the simulations uh, and following along on your own you may have noticed that this bake took a lot longer than the other bake and that's because it's creating the inflow object because it's creating more and more geometry as it fills in it takes more time for it to calculate it and spit that out to our uh, uh, our hard drive to write our meshes out. Now we have our simulation moving here and again we have that running it this is our our final view if we want to see it in preview just set it there and we can hit play again and you get a better idea of the timing of the motion here. Now of course you don't see it fill up as nicely as, as in the final view but it gives you a better idea of how quickly this is actually going to be filling in the space with that done the next thing I want to really show you is on the boundary settings some of our particles you can actually this is one of the newest things that were added to blenders fluid simulator is more fine particles because you can see even in the the final view here even in final it's it's a really cohesive set and it's not as violent as maybe we might want it to be so the way to take care of that is in the boundary settings here under tracer particles the way to do that is say we want to put in just 10 tracers and under our generate particles you can go from 0, 1 or greater than 1. Greater than 1 is more than your average amount of particles. 1 is your normal uh, and anything between 0 and 1 you can play with. So we're going to set this to 1 um, and leave our surface subdivision at 1 as well. Just to keep our, our baking times low for these particular simulations. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I want to compare this simulation to our particle simulation. So what I want to do is I want to set up a separate directory for our simulations. And that's simply going through here and we'll create another one, another directory called chapter 1 sim 2. So now that we have this directory set, you know, you see now that it refer, reverts back to the original shape of the domain and when we bake this will give us a whole new set of meshes for for our reference. And as it comes down you see here it doesn't do a whole lot different from from the previous but when it hits the ground you'll notice it perform, performs a little bit differently. Right around here is it'll start creating a little bit more of the particle setups and when it breaks out. If I were to put more force down here. In fact, let me let me do that just to make it really, really violent. Um, if I were to take this and I were to just raise our negative Z force, uh, let's do something. This should be nice and excessive. Now, if we bake it, you should see that it it will really, really blast the ground a bit more. Because at this point, it's it's become not a drop, but we're actually pushing water at the ground. And you see that the volume has actually a lot more because more of the inflow is pushing. So now as it hits, you get more of it filling in, breaking out. And of course, if I were to increase our render resolution, it would actually um, push the strength of it even further and you'd have even more little, little things pushing off. Right now, we're not seeing a whole lot of the particle action happening. Um, so what I'm going to do is... I'm going to play with our forces a little bit more and I'm also going to increase our subdivision. What happens is if you want to look at the boundary here, the surface subdivision, this right here, like the tooltip says it creates your ISO surface uh, subdivision which is necessary for the particles. One will give you your standard setup. I like to set mine generally around two for, for more final stuff. And Of course this just like inflow and just like adding any other little thing to it will actually increase our computation times because it actually involves more geometry. So now that we have this set, I will go back through and I really want to I want to have this push really hard. And this is far more force than we probably ever want to use coming out of here, but this should help out. And this is actually we want to have this break a little bit more. So I'm also going to set our domain real world size to being a bit larger because that will also influence 
things a bit more. Two meters should probably do it a bit more. This uh, the maximum setting on this is actually ten. Um, 10 meters for the real world size and that's just for math on the, on the uh, calculation there are a couple ways to get around that or to make it look like it's larger than a 10 meter domain but at this point we're just going to leave this at say 5 and that should serve, us, or serve our purposes quite well and now we will bake our um, fluids there we go and this one's going definitely going to take quite a bit longer, so I will definitely be pausing this, uh, and I'll get back to you guys as soon as this finishes uh, baking out. Okay, a cup of coffee and 96 frames later, and our simulation is complete. And you can see that it's a lot more turbulent than it was before. Also, because of the increased subdivisions and setup on it, the final playback is actually uh, quite a bit slower but you get a really good idea of the sort of turbulence stuff that comes out of this and this is all um, attributable to the particle tracers that we added in there uh, as well as increasing the downward velocity and the real world size because if you increase the real world size um, it has a tendency to break up a little bit sooner because um, a water faucet for instance will stay more cohesive whereas a waterfall on the other hand will break apart more easily um, just largely due to scale so we have that running there and of course if you hit escape to stop the simulation and change the standard view or to preview it goes right back to this and you can actually again see it now you don't see a whole lot more of the uh, the particle blowing out but you still get a good mo good idea for the motion that comes from it and you see a little bit of the particle shooting out now that we have this set and ready to go uh, the next thing that you really want to play with is obstacles because you know your fluid simulation is, is fun and all to have fluids pouring in but you really want it to hit something and and be blocked by it so we're gonna add an obstacle to it and in doing that we'll just go into our top view here and let's put this in orthogonal and we will add just a simple cube scale it out just a bit actually scale it just along the x and y axis that way it's more rectangular in shape and we also let's take this top face there and let's extrude that let's scale it in oh, let me scale it in this way there we go and then extrude this and scale it down this way that way we have a nice little bucket for for our surface here. Now that we're out of edit mode. And now of course, because it's not set as an obstacle and we haven't included it with the simulation, it's not doing a whole lot uh, relative to it. But it's easy enough to fix because it is within the, sp the span of our, our domain here. You can see it's within the size of our domain. We All we really have to do is enable it as an obstacle. That's really as, as simple as it gets. Now for running the simulation this way, actually let me lower this just a tad. I'm going to pull it down here and scale it in the X and Y just a bit more so we have a little bit more surface area to play with. Now that we have this here, all you really again have to do is we have this set as our obstacle because it's a closed surface we just do it as an init with a volume just to uh, decrease our render times here just to show you something really quickly I'm going to go back to our domain here and take off our tracers for a second just set the particles down to zero I'll set this to zero and set this back to one and that should reduce our render times back to what they need to be and also I'm going to set a third render target let me show you this real quick first let me move this to a separate layer that we're not looking at here first now you can actually see if you want if you wanted to compare our turbulent mesh which is put this in our final view 
if you wanted to compare the final turbulent mesh to the other mesh we created, our other simulation altogether, you select this directory, and all of a sudden we have our old simulation right back. And so if you want to render multiple different simulations, this is a good way to retarget your simulation setups. In our particular case, though, because we want to have this obstacle floating in here, we're going to make a third one. This is simple as going here, we'll call this chapter one sim three. Now with that directory selected, we have a whole nother playground, more or less. And since we set this as our object, our obstacle that is, set the init and volume, all we really need to do here is bake again. And now this bake should uh, be fairly quick. Comes through, drops in, and now it actually will hit our block, fill it up, and pour over the edges the way it, it ought to work. And again, this is also using the real world, si real world size of 5 rather than 1, which we originally played with. So, uh, and of course, the force pushing down into it, this is what's causing it to splatter way back up. But that's, it's an obstacle, and that's what it's supposed to do. And again, because the top of the domain hits here is the reason why it stops right there. So, this is great for, for um, your standard, I have an obstacle, I want to run water into it. You want to run water into a, a building, a sink, a bathtub, a toilet, uh, some, a body. That's, that's, this is basically the process. You make an object, set it as an obstacle, um, and then run the simulation again, and everything is accounted for. It runs right around it as expected. But, not only can you have still objects, you can also have moving objects, which we will do right now. So I'm not going to push this down. Again, you can see it fills right up, splatters out, and does really nicely. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our object here. I'm going to go into our side view, because I want it to spin this way. And let me split this window and give myself my IPO curve editor. so that I can rotate this properly. I'm going to set my initial rotation for this at my first frame to actually be rotated slightly away. So I can say set my rotation keyframe here and then I think by the time this is where the, the running a simula simulation ahead of time also will give you a good idea of where you want your timing set because I want to have it pretty much rotated the other direction by this point, which is at frame 12, so within half a second. So this thing's going to be spinning relatively quickly. So all I have to do is rotate it around, and I want to have it at least 180, something like that. So if I set my next rotation keyframe there, we can actually see that's where that's set. And I'm going to actually set my curve to extend in a extrapolation. So now it constantly you can see it scrub better here. It will keep on spinning even after I'm out of the time. Which is what I want in this particular case. So now that we have our moving obstacle, that's pretty much all we have to do. We go back in, we select our domain again, and let's bake it. And so now it starts off, as, as expected, rotating. And as it hits, then it actually re the fluid will react with the proper velocities and vectors necessary for it to move. And you see what's going on. It'll actually hit it, and as this rotates around, it'll actually spin around. And because this is an influence, it's actually flowing in fairly quickly. It's going to fill in the base pretty well, so it's actually what's going to do is it's going to scoop it up once it starts filling, which is going to be really neat. And in fact, I'm going to pause the simulation here, because I want to re-enable those uh, tracer particles and make it really, really you know, nice and spinny and violent. 
So we go back to our boundary settings here. I'm going to put this back at 10. I'm going to set this back to 1. Set our subdivisions at 2. And uh, pick a good view for me to watch it spin and blow up. Let's go with that. Then all we have to do is go back and bake. And now that this is baking with all of our tracer particle settings, this is again it's going to take a lot longer uh, than it did initially, but it will look very, very good. And while this bakes, I'm going to pause yet again, and we'll be back when it's finished. So now that we have the simulation completed on this, uh, you can see if we were to scrub across on it that we have a lot more of our particles blowing off of this creating what we want. Now of course if you run this over to one of the higher frames you run into the problem of the fact that we spent threw out a lot of fluid so it covers up the entire screen but with a change in the material it's not going to be that big of a deal I don't think. So what we can do is we can actually select our camera here and go into our top-down view, grab the camera, I think we can get a good shot from right over around here somewhere. If you aim that in right, set this to our camera view, select the camera and position it for some interesting framing. Pull it out just a tad, something around like that, so that it still has our spin happening down there, and we're still within the frame just a bit. Now, the other thing we can do is let me pull this out just a tad more. Pull this down because this is closer to what we're going to be seeing anyway. What we can do is we can we don't really need to see our fluid object anymore, so we'll just hide that layer and we need to adjust our materials on this to get it to look a little bit better. So if we go into our materials buttons and set this to our current default material, we'll just take that and run our spec all the way down. And that's our all oh, that'll be our standard material on that and we'll keep this at white. Then we want to do something a little bit different with our fluid. We want to have it look more fluidy. So we'll create a new material altogether and we will use our Ornair and Tune Shaders actually to do this. Drop our ref, increase our roughness just a bit. Lower our alpha to something substantially low that we can see through. And you want to be able to see through it so we're going to turn on our ray transparency and we're going to give it a depth of something around 5 because we got a bunch of these things that we're going to be seeing through. We're going to set our index of refraction to around 1.22 give or take and our frame will set that to 1.5 give us a little bit clearer center there and the other thing we're just because we the reason for using tune is it gives us really decent spec if we set our spec relatively high but the size of it pretty small really small let's change it to Suzanne's head so we can actually see what the specs gonna look like on there so we have that set fairly small but with a relatively higher value Set our traceable shadows. This will give us a relatively good fluid. And since this is on white and we're gonna have a our dark background, let's give ourselves a little bit of color here. Let's uh let's make our fluid more towards the reds. Mm, nice warm color there. That way you see some of the red tint coming through. A red hue that is. Alright, with that set, the other thing that we can actually do is take advantage of the motion blur. And the way you do that is you use the node editor. You can't, Blender's materials it has an in blur setting here, but for the vector information that's in the fluids, you want to use the, the vector blur that's part of the compositor, composite nodes. So you use nodes on this and just select this, grab it and pull it out of the way. And we'll add a new filter, which is a vector builder filter. Just taking the image output from that, 
plug it in, plugging it into that. Pull this up so we can actually see what's going on. Our Z level's coming here. We need to feed some speed data here. So go to our render layers and activate vector, which will add speed up in here. Connect that to it. Uh, we're going to keep our blur factor at one. I think that'll be suitable. And I believe I think we can get something really interesting here right around 2021. Get a nice little splat and explosion sort of set up here. There we go. We can go with that. And because this machine is actually threaded, we can actually use more than one thread on it. And I'm going to render this right into the image editor, which is going to pop it up right there for us. And the only last step to doing that is to use the do composite button, which will use all of our compositor settings from the node editor. With all of that set, well, put the quality under this and choose ping as my output. With all of that set, we should be able to render this and it will look fairly good. Oh, one small note before before we actually let this finish rendering. Let's put this back into our 3D view. The one last little thing I, we need to set is our world settings here. Because we don't want this standard blue, we're going to go with a little bit more of a dark color, just a dark gray setup here. And we're going to also turn on ambient occlusion and use distance with a distance factor of 5. That will give us a good default setting on that. Now we can render it and have a lot of fun. All right, so the anima the animation, the render has been complete, and you can see our vector motion blur actually works very well for feeling that force of the fluid being pushed in. Because remember, that's a high high z force we added in there, and these actually focused ones are actually the particles and stuff that have actually bounced out and come are, come closer to us and aren't moving as much. It looks a little weird for a still, interesting though, though it is, it looks a little weird, but in animation it actually sells the effect very, very well. Uh, a couple other things you might want to note in this is in the 3D view we have here, you we baked it and did everything here in a resolution of 70, it only required 30 megs of baked memory. This is system memory, not hard drive memory to actually uh, do the simulation. Now for things that require more detail uh, and and whatnot, you might want to run it at a higher resolution. Uh, 250, 200, 250 tends to work very well. 300 for 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 special cases. Uh, the downside, of course, is if you do a resolution of 250, you're going to require, and it may be more or less depending on particles and other uh, factors that you add into it. This particular one would require a gig and a half, almost a gig and a half worth of uh, system memory to run the simulation and depending on whether the machine has that it will start thrashing on the hard drive and doing that sort of stuff so that's a consideration you need to make when running your fluid simulations and baking them uh, for many cases I find that 200 tends to work very well it's less than a gig and gives you most of the effects you need so that's pretty much it when it comes to the basics of Blender's fluid simulator. You know pretty much all the tools you have to go with for most of its basic uses. The next few chapters in this DVD series will be covering uh, more more exciting things and advanced topics like flooding cities, running water mills, faking smoke, and splashing strangers on the street. So hopefully you're gonna have a lot of fun with that. Now we're here for chapter two, putting water out of a faucet. Fairly simple task, but it's there's some some tricks that need that should be done for it. Uh, as you can see, I've already preloaded a a sink model that we've already, that we have built, and I've done some presets as well. Setting up the camera, 24 frames a second. This is going to be a four second animation, so it's 95 96 frames to completion, and I have the res resolution properly set. This is our sink couple things we're going to need to do. First, here, using our sink here, going to our physics buttons, if we enable this as an obstacle, this is going to be 
how the fluid comes out. And we're also going to have our faucet head set up as an obstacle. Just standard uh, slip, or sorry, standard in it, volume in it. And uh, we have a uh, partially slipping, so the water sticks to it partially. That's the basic setup for your obstacles in this. Then you want to take, I have our fluid set up on a separate level layer. I just colored it green so we can differentiate it. And for the settings on our domain, uh, I'm going to set our resolution lower so we can actually watch the render happen. Put this down to 70. And again, a four second simulation. And we're going to have our simulation actually take place here at chapter 2 sim. Select that directory. And that's going to be our final place for that. Under the advanced tab, nothing really special here. Real world size, I set this to being about half a meter because that's pretty close to what, what we would want for our sink. And nothing really different on our boundary except for increasing the subsurface subdivision to two. But for now, I want to set that back down to one just so we can render quickly here. All right, so we have our domain set up and we have simple uh, a simple fluid uh, material set up there as we've been setting up before tinted it again a little bit green now the next thing we have to do is actually set up our uh, our fluid object and what I've done is I set up one object right in here if you zoom in you can see this this is just a little cube and looking at this cube turn our axis on it so you can actually see we, I've rotated it so our y direction is this way and our z direction is that way just putting it right there in the neck of our of our faucet here then setting this up properly we go in and to our physics buttons with that enabled as an inflow object obviously because we're turning the faucet on and I've set the velocity on this rather high actually to negative five in the x direction and negative five in the y direction I have it pushing that means it's going technically this way because um, I've enabled our local inflow coordinates one of the cool things about uh, about the fluid simulator is you don't have to use the global coordinates for your forces you can actually use your local inflow co coordinates the reason I push it to the side a little bit is to give it a little bit of spin as it goes out uh, give it a little bit of an interesting look there. Now, then again, at the speed, you, you may or may not notice it very well. So, with that set as our inflow object and our domain set with our obstacles properly put there, we'll just hide that layer again. All we have to do is bake. So, put this in here, make sure our resolution's right, and we're going to bake our simulation. Now, when this starts, you're not going to see it in here. Actually, let me cancel this out so we can actually see what the fluid's doing. Because what I did is actually, you may have noticed on this object that y, my y direction is this way, right? And I have it going in the negative y, so it's pushing that direction. So just letting you know it's not going this way and pushing back. Now, all we have to do hide that layer again select our domain and bake. I'm going to leave this in the wireframe mode so you can actually see what the fluid ends up doing in here so let's bake that again and this is a little bit lower resolution but you can see it comes out really fast at the first frame it's halfway out so the, turning on the water is right there near instantaneous and it runs right through and again since this is a closed object using your inflow uh, using the volume in it works the best on that now you notice the weird thing here the fluid pushes back this way after hitting the lip that's part of the because of the stickiness of it and it drops it back when you run at a higher resolution it actually goes out with the force so let me let this finish cooking and we'll come back when it's finished okay now that we have this pretty much set. You'll see we've run into a little bit of a problem. One, our fluid <laughs> a 
we don't have this pipe working very well as our as a uh, as an adequate impediment to our fluid. It's not one it's set up as an obstacle, but it's not obviously working well as an obstacle. Now, if your angle and your shot is just from up here, it's not that such a such a big a deal. Uh, but for our cases, we maybe we want to shoot a shot that comes around like so. If that's the case, then we're going to have a problem because the fluid's going to go through our sink. Part of the problem is that this model, when it was made, separated these two pieces, the, the pipe itself and the sink. Now, that, in general, that's not a big deal, but again, for the fluid simulator, it causes a problem for us, and we don't want to have that problem deal with it. So, in order to take care of that, we just set up a proxy object as our, as our block. And we do that, you can see this on this layer, actually just show this layer only. This right here is our proxy object which we have enabled as an obstacle. This right here will keep all of our fluids doing well and again you see it's one whole unit. Now you also notice if you look at it in the same with the sink it's actually inset just ever so slightly from our our inflow, I mean our, our sink obstacle. That's basically to keep it at low resolutions from from looking too wacky. Then the other thing is just to make sure we don't have anything coming out and really showing up from the simulation we also have one another little object in here which I will enable as an outflow object basically any fluid that comes and touches this will outflow out of the system which basically means it, it effectively disappears so if, keeps our simulation running nice and nice and clean. Turn off my axes on this. So that's that's basically the setup we have now. Set this as an outflow. Just set up a cube there is about the at the base as an outflow. Then we have our proxy object which is set up as a shell as our obstacle. Then we have to go back to our sink and take it off of being an obstacle. So we just disable that. Now we have just the proxy acting as our fluid obstacle. And when you rerun the simulation now, if I open up my fluid layer there, we'll hide this, select that. We re when we rebake it, you'll see that we won't have our fluid popping through to the bottom. So I'm going to bake this yet again and hit that. And when it completes, we'll come back and take a look at it again. Okay, now that we have this simulated this way, you notice that nothing pops through, and our fluid comes right on out. If you look at this in the side view, if we take that out, and let's put our hidden layer back in, if you play this back, you see as soon as it hits that this inflow object right here, the second our fluid hits that, let me select both of these at the same time so you can see what happens. The second it comes through and hits that, it just goes away. And our proxy serves its purpose properly and keeps our fluid from intersecting and falling out. Now, one of the things you may have also noticed is that as this thing comes down, it's not, I mean, it's a very sloppy faucet coming out. And we might not want it to behave that way, especially having these drops coming back this way. It's kind of unrealistic. It doesn't work right. That's almost entirely attributable to the low resolution uh, baking, or not low resolution, low resolution baking. It's all, it's almost entirely attributable to the low resolution that we've chosen for this. So, if you run it at a higher resolution, you actually see with a velocity coming out, it actually shoots straight up here. And I had this running at 200 and let me show you what that looks like just by hitting a bake and we'll come back this is going to take a fairly long amount of time but the time when it comes out you'll see exactly what I'm talking about so let me hit the bake button and let us cook yet again now with a higher resolution make you see the fluid actually definitely comes further out from here and comes and actually splatters out and you see that and again our performance gets a bit more choppy and uh, even changing frames takes more time because it actually has to load each and every single one of these me uh, each mesh per frame to do this. Now of course 
this is still not entirely realistic. For a still shot, this would probably work out very, very well. You have a nice little still shot without any motion blur. It will look pretty interesting. It will work very, very nicely. But, say for instance, we want to have the faucet just pour straight out like a typical faucet. Well, obviously, this faucet, the way it's modeled, fluid's going to be coming all the way across, and it's going to push itself at the top just like that. So that's not necessarily, using this methodology of this cube on the inside, it's probably not going to work be the best for us for the effect we're looking for. This is good for something that looks, that's, that's realistic as far as motion, but we want something that is also more more inclined to what people are used to with a faucet dripping straight down. So we have a solution for that as well. I'm going to drop this down to 70 and I'm going to hide our fluid layer just to keep things a little bit more responsive for us. And I've set up another object. So let me go in here to our fluid ob object here. I'm going to disable this inflow and I'm going to ha have on this other layer just a single circle. And it's placed, you can see, it's placed right there at the tip of our of our water faucet. You can see it. So the fluid would come straight down because when I do enable as an inflow, because it's not a, a three it's it's just a plane, it's just a circle, we have it doing an init shell and we just use Z coordinate down, setting it to a negative two. So not only with gravity, but also it has its own force pushing down. Now, if you want to simulate that, we load our fluid back up, which will take a few seconds because again, this is a very dense mesh. And I'll also hide this layer. Now we run our simulation using this fluid. Uh, again, I set this back down to 70, and I mean, let's save this resolution because it took us long enough to get it. Let's create another sim directory. Let's put this at 2. Now, put this on a camera view and let's bake it. Now what's going to happen is you should see it come straight down and perform a little bit more nicely. Now it's a little still choppy, but that again is because of the low resolution that we're using for this bake. But you can see as it comes down, it's, it's behaving, despite being blocky and choppy, it's moving in a way that's, that's more, uh, more akin to what we would expect and want from a regular water faucet that's, that's pushing water out of it. So that's working fairly well. And just to prove the point of what happens, see there's our, our nice little stream there. And just to show show what's going to happen at a higher resolution, let me quit this out. We get our motion working a lot nicer there because it's coming straight down. Now all we have to do, I'm going to set this resolution up to 200, and we're going to rebake this at the higher resolution, and you'll see what happens then. So let's hit the bake button. And again, we're going to let this cook. The other thing that, that will increase our render times but also make it look better is to set our, sub, our, our surface subdivisions up to 2. And again, we don't really need tracer particles or anything like that because this is just a straight cohesive flow. So if we do that, it should work a lot nicer. So let's go ahead and hit bake. And let me share my directory set properly. Sim 2. Good. Hit bake and let it go. And again, this will definitely take quite some time to render, so I will be back when it's completed. All right, now we have our 200 resolution fluid simulation complete, and as you can see, it's a lot more of a cohesive stream. It didn't change anything except for the resolution, and it works out a lot better. Now, of course, this simulation took less drive space than the other one because our, our inflow force was at negative 2 as opposed to two forces of negative 5 and this should actually render out fairly nicely. Now the only other step that that's necessary to make this look really good when you render it out is of course putting in some motion blur to it. You can get a good still with this um, or you could actually add in a motion blur setup which I've already taken the liberty of doing on our compositor nodes here. 
And again, it's a simple standard setup. You have your render layer, which we output vector information for, so we get the speed. Fil fill that into our vector blur filter. Um, I just kept the blur factor of one, and then spit that right out to our compositor. And when you render it out, you get a nice looking view. So that, in a nutshell, is how you make water come out of a faucet using the Blender Fluid Simulator. Oh, sorry, let me mark one more thing. It would also probably be a good idea at some point to animate this rotating to turn on the fluid. But this is the core, so there you go. Okay, welcome to chapter three, Faking Smoke. Now, a couple of caveats ahead of time. Blender itself does not have any sort of voxel implementation yet, so the uh, there's no, you're not going to have any of the volumetrics that you normally would have in other applications. However, that is going to be coming along soon, and we can, in the meantime, we can fake the proper behavior using Blender's Fluid Simulator, and I'm going to show you how to do that. A couple of things up front. Um, I've set our frame rate to 24 frames a second at 96 frames, so it's another 4 second animation uh, simulation. And I've already set our resolution properly. We're going to use our domain, our default cube as our domain, so I'm going to scale that up to an adequate size for us. This should do us fairly well. If we go into our domain settings. First also, let's make this set smooth so it's proper there. And we're going to go into our physics buttons. Again, as it always, and set that up as our domain. A couple, th few things we should note for fluids while I set up the proper simulation path. One thing in particular is that fluids themselves are, uh, not fluids, smoke itself is a fluid with a couple little caveats to it. One in particular is that it's more viscid, viscous than you would say for, for water. And honey comes, using the honey viscosity default we have here comes close to what we want. but um, I found that by manually entering the value of 3 and 5, ten, for 3 for the value and, and 5 for the negative exponent actually works pretty well for us. And if we keep the real world size here, it keeps more of its cohesion there as we want. The other thing is that since we're dealing with smoke, we're not really, really concerned with any sort of gravity here. Now, one of the notes about Blender's fluid simulator is it doesn't really handle zero gravity um, properly, so the best way to handle that is to set that to uh, a very low value of 0 0.001 and that should be perfectly alright for nullifying uh, your settings there. Also is compressibility. This is a, is another setting that that can be adjusted because liquids um, typically are not compressible whereas gases as a fluid are compressible so you can actually increase this setting and play with it a bit more. We'll show do a couple tests with that to show what that does. In the meantime the other thing we want to worry about is that we're going to be simulating this. We have a four second simulation, but because we're going to be pushing an inflow in, we actually want to have a little bit more force to it, but we want it to that force to come out. At the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to set our end time to be 0.1. And the reason for doing this is that we're going to basically smoke looks like it moves like a regular fluid, but in slow motion. This is going to give us a very slow motion feel for our fluid. Now we have our domain set pretty much the way we want. Now we need to actually add what our smoke's going to be coming from. In this particular case, we're going to make a cigarette because it's quick and easy. Adding a cylinder, scaling that in. Oh, scaling it lengthwise. Somewhere around there to give it cigarette likeness. All right, so we have that set. Then the other thing we want to do is actually, while we're at it, we will, well, we don't have to do that. First we can do is set our rotation on this. We're going to have our cigarette looking in an orientation like it would typically be find it in an ashtray. Put this in the camera view so we get a good set. I think that's going to work out fairly well for us. Now we need to add our 
emitter for our smoke. So I'm just going to use a regular icosphere. Scale that in a bit. And we need to position it at the tip of our cigarette. So we just select our centermost piece there, snap our cursor to that, then snap our icosphere to the cursor. And it's positioned fairly well. Of course, now we need to scale that so it actually fits at the tip of our cigarette fairly well, which I think it does now. And that frames nicely. Now, our cigarette itself, we're not going to worry too much about at the moment. In the meantime, we can take our icosphere, which is going to be our source of smoke, enable that as an inflow object. And because it's going to be burning, so that's, an, that's why it's an inflow, because it's going to be moving upwards, we set our z value to 1, and that should give us enough force to push it up. Now, with that set, we should have all of our settings properly arranged for giving us some smoke. Also, set this resolution to 100, because at, at 50, it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on. So now we have our resolution set, and everything's ready to bake, um, we're ready to go. Now, you'll see, because it's moving slow motion, actually we have our plume coming up and moving fairly well for a 100 resolution smoke plume. And of course, it's moving and behaving as you would expect smoke to. Of course, it's not very interesting. We, uh, we don't have anything blocking it up. It doesn't distort or, or do anything crazy like that. So in order to deal with that, we can actually make that a little bit prettier by giving our smoke some problems because this is not as interesting as we might want it to be. Easy way to do that is to give it an obstacle which we will make invisible later. So we can set this up, just create another little icosphere. And what we'll do is we're going to make this a narrow little little guy. And he's going to get in the way. And we'll set that. We have our simulation happening here so we can actually see where it is. Let's grab it and pull this in the X direction. Something like that. Definitely so it's still within the camera view. That keeps it, gives us some interest. And I'll offset it just slightly. Alright. And that should give us enough there, and then all you have to do is enable that as an obstacle. And we will move that to another layer. So now that it's an obstacle, now that we have that set, we can select our domain again, and bake it. Now, it should be understanding that there's an obstacle here, and it will move up and move around it. this gives you a little bit closer to the behavior you would be looking for in smoke. Uh, it doesn't separate quite as nicely as we want. We might want to have a sharper tip there on our on our smoke there because it's kind of uniform in the way that it's breaking up right now. But it also comes up, wraps around and, and, and does that. So we can actually, if we stretch it out in the Z direction, I think that'll, that'll help it out fairly well. So what we'll do is we'll escape out of the simulation, open up our show our other layer here. Let's grab that and let's scale that in the Z direction just a tad more. And as we also let's pull it down so it breaks it up a little bit sooner. Now let's also see how narrow that is. Right, if we rotate this just a bit that way it's not as obvious that it's symmetrical and, and with the global coordinates there. Now, we should have something that behaves a little bit more nicely. So we'll hide this layer and go ahead and rebake. Now we have our fluid come, our, well it's still a fluid, our, our smoke coming up and, and breaking up and going around this. As you can see, it actually goes and it wraps fairly well. Of course, just like anything else, with an inflow and adding obstacles, this of course adds more geometry. So as it goes further and further, the baking time gets a little bit longer per.
But that said, we're getting some fairly decent results here. And the motion on it's not so bad, because at 34 frames, I mean, this is going to be moving fairly nicely. And we'll pause while this finishes rendering. Now that our simulation has finished baking, you can actually play it back, and you can see the motion of it coming up, moving around our obstacle, and just making itself all floaty. Works fairly well. And in fact, if you play it back, a little bit, this is pretty much close to what it's going to look. It's, it'll move a little bit faster than this in, in the simulation, in the actual render, but it's not too bad. And this is pretty close to kind of what we're looking for here. Now, what we might want to do is, is play with this a little bit more. Let's, let's adjust some of our compressibility on this. So, we want to go in here, go to our Advanced tab, and change our compressibility. Let's set that to 0.1, make it a little bit more compressible. It's, again, it's not necessarily the setting we want to use for everything, but it works pretty well. And, now that we have that set, just go ahead and bake it, and you'll see it come up, and you'll see it, it, it's a little bit more narrow, and it breaks apart here and there a little bit, a little bit more nicely. Uh, at this point, it becomes sort of a, a personal preference as to the sort of way you like it and the way you want to see it move. In my particular case, I, I kind of like it like this. So we'll let this finish cooking, and you can see the difference on, on this one. All right, so now that we have our fluids baked here and our smoke sort of simulating, we can actually run it, and you can see it. the compressibility actually does help it out quite a bit. Now, there are a couple other things we can do to give this a little bit more natural motion, because it's still kind of chunky at the bottom, and the cigarette itself should actually be influencing the motion a bit more. So, the first thing we want to do is actually take our cigarette object and enable it as an obstacle. Now that we have that as an obstacle, let's rerun our, our simulation here. And I'm not going to let it, I'm not going to have to we can let it cook just shortly, but you'll see something really quickly here. Because of the influence of the cigarette, it actually diverts our force in this direction, bypassing our obstacle which of course is not exactly what we want it to do. So, in order to alleviate this, it's simple, we just move our obstacle into the way. We let this cook a little bit more so that we have enough frames to see where the smoke's gonna be heading. Now that we have that, with the motion you see, it actually swirls and moves a little bit more smoke like this way. So we take our blocking obstacle here, and we'll just move this right along the x-axis put it right in the way, and uh, while we're at it, let's rotate it along the y-axis, sort of to split that up. And that should give us a little bit more interesting behavior. If I pull that, something like this. Now that we have that there, we'll just hide that again, and rebake. Now the motion we'll have the natural behavior coming up from in here. It'll hit our obstacle. We'll get that split that, that we really want to get from our, our, our smoke there, so it splits off and behaves in a way we might expect it to. And as that cooks, you'll see it start to spin around and basically be more smoke-like, have a little bit more of that random feel to it. Now there's one more thing we can actually do, two more things actually we can, we can do to make this motion a little bit more natural, although this is looking fairly good the way it is. One of the things that would really help would be increasing our resolution. That, you know, just like anything else, that will probably help this out a fair amount, especially down in this zone. And some of these parts that are breaking apart now won't break apart as easily using a, a higher resolution render. So that would be the first one. The other one to do would actually, I'll show you that right now, we can cancel out this this bake session because the motion on it's actually pretty nice the way it comes out and splits and does that. It's a very very nice nice behavior there. So what we can do two things. First, we can increase our resolution. And second, 
we can go under our boundary options here and it's, we can not load any particles. If you load particles you'll have a little bit of turbulence here which may be good for uh, other sorts of smoke like maybe a burning house or smoke coming out of a chimney. But for a cigarette you don't want to use particles as much. However, using increasing the surface subdivision will actually have it wrap that obstacle a little bit better. One of the other things I want to do on this obstacle is I'm not liking exactly how it's adjusting our behavior. We still want some upward velocity here. So I'm going to take this in this mode here and just select a couple of those and put myself in my proportional editing tool, grab it and rotate it around just to get a slightly different feel for it. So it should now curve and go back up, which is more along the lines of what we want it to do. Now, hide that again, pull this back on. We have our subdivision set to 2, and we'll keep the, our render resolution at 100 because the subdivision should help. So now we just bake it. And of course, because we increased our subdivision surfaces here, it'll increase the render time. Therefore, we're going to take a pause, and when it's done rendering, or done baking, um, we'll take a look at it and see where we're at. All right, now we have our new baking done using the subdivision surfaces on there. And you can see the motion is definitely more distorted and definitely a bit more smoke-like, more of the behavior that I personally was looking for in this. And of course, hitting play will give you that sort of feeling. Of course, this is not the real-time motion of it. In fact, if you were to hit escape and change our view here back to the preview, which isn't, granted, isn't going to give you a whole lot because we left that at 25, but if you hit play on that, you can see a little bit better how it's going to sort of the timing and the motion of how it comes up. So, we have that. Let's put this back on our final view. Now, the, the big issue is making it look smoke-like. Because, I mean, granted, this, this is a, a, a mesh, and so you have to do some adjustments to it to make it look more smoke-like, since Blender, again, doesn't have any sort of true voxels of imitation. We do this with, for the most part, our materials. And I've set up a material here. First, I'm going to set the cigarette to our basic uh, shadeless setup here, with zero spec and white is our color on that. And of course this has been sharing that same material but I've already created a material for it that's more smoke like and I've been I used ramps to adjust our, our whiteness and our alpha uh, and then I, of course I used the Z transparency to cover that. Now with that set the render on it will look a little bit more nice and before we go further Let's get our world settings proper to the way we want it to be. Set the dark background and turn on our ambient occlusion and using distances of 5 works fairly well for our purposes. Now, going into here, let's load this into our image editor. When you render this, loads it up and it should put it pretty transparent fairly smoke-like in the way it loads it up here. Now, granted, it's it's not as good as we would want it to be, and there are ways we can do it to still deal with that, because part of the problem, of course, is that we have the shadows on it, which we like the shadows, but the problem is that uh, we have these hard edges here. These hard edges are, are definitely not helping our smokish feel. So we want to blur this entire deal, and we can do that using Blender's, Blender's uh, com uh, node-based compositor. Also, I need to remove our icosphere to another la layer. So, take it back here. First things first, let's move this to the same layer as our obstacle so that's not in the way. And let me also pull this to a more interesting frame. I think that one that one should do us fairly well. Now what we want to do is we want to use Blender's uh, compositor nodes, which we can just load right up here by splitting the window and going to our node editor, going to compositing and using nodes. Make that smaller. Yeah, that's all we need. Now, basically, we want to 
keep this sharp, keep our cigarette sharp, and blur our smoke. So let's set our smoke on a separate layer as well. We'll put our smoke on this layer. So now we have two layers, one for our cigarette and one for our smoke. And we'll set our light and our camera on both layers so that, are, so that they are always visible. Now that we have that set, we need to go to our render layers and create another render layer. For the first render layer, all it is is going to be our cigarette. Then we need a new render layer, which is just going to be our smoke. Then we take this, which is render layer 1, grab it and pull that whole setup there, add another input of a render layer, and this one's going to be render layer 2, which is just our cigarette. And you can see that by clicking that, and it should just load our set up there for the cigarette, which is exactly the way we want it. Let's escape out of that. F11. Now, we need to combine, we need to first blur our smoke. So, we just run a filter on it. Simple blur filter. Grab that. And we'll just set this to 15. And now we need to combine these, of course. And the way, the way to do that, let's grab this, pull it over here. We'll just use Z combine. So we'll add a, a Z combine node. Grab that, pull it up. This connects here. C level here. Our image connects there. And we'll just use the same Z that we had from that. With those things set, should be a fairly simple matter of grabbing this, pulling this over, sending our output there. Now, just so we have an idea of what this is going to look like, if we put an output here, just a viewer output, pull this down here so we can see it. And I think we want to use a Gaussian setup there. Now, when we render, do composite. Rendering should theoretically blur it for us. And I will let this cook, and I'll pause it and come back to it. So, we get our render. Unfortunately, it's, it's not quite like we wanted because um, we forgot to add an extra step. We need to actually blur our Z depth. So, let's grab that, duplicate it, and if we just run our Z into that, and then run the output of that into our Z, we have a nice blurry setup here. And of course, tweaking and adding with our animation, this will give us a fairly realistic smoke setup. So, that right there is the basic way of faking smoke with the fluid simulator in Blender. Chapter 4, Make It a Waterfall. Alright, so, in this particular chapter, we're going to, like I said, make a waterfall. And I've done, like on the sink one, we've done a couple presets on this. I've made my cliff of d despair. <laughs> uh, set my camera up ahead of time already. With uh, This is going to be a 4 second simulation. And 24 frames per second. That should get us what we want here. Plus I'm going to set this up to ping. And up the quality there. And, like I said, 96 frames a second. 24, uh, 96 frames, 24 frames a second. That's a 4 second render. And I've set up my domain object, just like uh, before. This particular domain object is enabled here. Um, I'm 
final render I'm going to put this at 150 but for these tests I'm going to put this about half that just under half that at 70 and using uh, a little bit heavier gravity than normal so it will pull it down and I increased the real, real world size, maxed it out actually to the full 10 meter size. Now the dot droplets are going to be a little bit bigger than, than, than what we want and there's some things we can do to take care of that. We're using the water's viscosity and as far as boundaries go I put in a lot of tracer par particles and with the normal amount and using your standard surface subdivision here. So with that thrown in let me uh, set our location for our simulation, which is going to be chapter 4-sim. Alright, now we have our domain. Our cliff is going to be enabled as an obstacle because, of course, it's not a closed surface. It is set up as a shell. And on this particular layer, we have two other objects, which let me hide our domain so we can actually see what they are. The two other objects on this layer are going to be the source of our waterfall, which we enable as an inflow object, and I've set an initial velocity in the y direction, local using local coordinates. So uh, if we turn on the axis for that. There's the axis using your local coordinates. We're going negative three force in the negative uh, y in the y direction, and we're going to be pushing it also a little bit further down in the negative z direction. So it should push it that way as our inflow object. Turn off my y, uh, my axis there, and then rather than have it create a splash on its own and create it, most waterfalls go into a reservoir. So this is going to be our reservoir, which is a standard fluid in it as a volume because we set it up as a cube uh, it has no velocity it just sort of sits there and lets the flow hit it so we have that set we have our fluid for landing we have our obstacle and we have our waterfall waterfall fluid if we set up our domain here put this in the camera view so we can see it get a nice camera angle set here and now we just let it bake Again, we set the end time to four seconds because it's 96 uh, frames long, and just bake it, and we'll see what happens. Now, because I turned on the uh, surface subdivision or turned it up to two, that actually increases the, uh, the render time, of course. And as you can see, it starts coming, and will flow right on off into here. But let me quit this real quick and hide our fluid materials. That way when we do this you can actually see the fluid. Because right now there's our fluid. And I'm going to set this around that frame. Now if we bake it we have our source coming establishes it. There we go. We have our source coming and it just will start pouring right on out because we gave it that, that nice initial velocity. And of course with the with the amplified gravity that Y force isn't going to push it out to here. It's going to come straight down afterwards. The reason for setting the gravity like that instead of setting the Z force on that is Z is going to be initial so it would be pushing it down as opposed to dragging it down after it comes out. Which is why we have that increase. It's one of the ways we can also sort of simulate a larger real world size than we have available. So we let that cook and I'll be back when it's done. So we've baked it and as you can see our fluid flows out and drops down. And You see some from the particles we set up that there's some anticipation down there. These at a higher resolution you actually see the drops that come out for it. Now, the thing is, we have the motion working pretty much the way we want. It comes out and behaves properly. You might notice that the setup to this isn't too dissimilar from the uh, the sync setup, except that we've increased the real world size, and we have to do a couple of little tweaks to make it look like it's uh, like it's uh, larger than a, than a 10 meter waterfall. 
And so, the next thing, of course, we want to do is we want to render this at the higher resolution. I set this at 150, and it tends to work fairly well and give us a, a decent render render speed in response to that. So we have that set, and that's really the only thing I've changed real quick. I'm going to render that out, uh, sorry, bake that out real quick so you can see exactly how how the flow of that comes out. And uh, when that finishes, we will, we will reconvene. Okay, so we've rendered this at the higher resolution, and of course it's got that little choppy nature we're so used to now on the on the high resolution renders, but now you can see that where it was empty, there's actually a stream happening there now. And you can actually see around frame 40 where it actually has already hit the water and gets us some of this nice little splatter in the, in the reservoir. Now, if you... I kind of like having it spray out like this a bit, but if you want to reduce that a little bit, you can actually go into your boundary settings and where it says generate particles, reduce that down to less than one. Um, you still have a lot of particles, but what happened was they'll, they'll bind closer to the actual stream. Um, I kind of like it the way it is, so I'm going to leave it like that. But there are other things we need to do to still make it look like it's a waterfall from a from a fairly high level. One of the th next things we do we can do because I mean we have our splatter there and everything, but we want to give it a little bit more of a mist flowing around it. The easiest way to do that, of course, is with straight up particles. And what I've done is I've actually created that particle system here on this layer, as you can see. Let me just select that layer by itself, and basically just created a particle, gave it 5,000 particles with uh, a life that would fit our, our 96 frame animation here. Um, it doesn't generate any children or anything, and I have it generating because the actual object itself is just a single face. Uh, it's actually the front face of our fluid object. We're just using that, reusing that. And we have that, and then our particle motion, we uh, basically gave it a, a normal energy because the normal on this face is actually face pointing that direction. So we gave it some uh, a normal force, a z-force, and a y-force just to give it y in the global sense and z so it would go down when it fell down after being pushed from its normal. This basically is just all you had to do was play with it and tweak the numbers to get it to match our stream. And you could sit and basically adjust back and forth what you want to do to have it arranged. And this will give us a nice little mist around our uh, waterfall coming down. And so combining all three of these elements with our world and our water splatting, uh, splashing down, then we just have one other thing to do to really, really push the, the scale on this. So, so far what we've done is on our fluid, we have produced a lot of particles for it, given it, maxed out the real world size and given it a larger than normal gravity uh, z-force. We also added our particles on here and the last thing of course we want to do is give it some of the nice vector motion blur. So we split this and I've already set that up in our known editor which by this point it should be fairly the same sort of setup we've been using. Uh, we have our speed and uh, image and Z going into our vector blur node which spits out to our compositor node. The only other difference I think that we have in here is that I actually enabled Blender's old M blur uh, as well because particles don't blur as well using the vector blur uh, algorithm. Now of course using M blur will very very much increase your uh, your render times but it does inc make the effect look a lot nicer. Uh, the other thing I did is on the vector blur rather than use a standard one point ver uh, blur factor I have increased it to one and a half, and that really gives it more of that rushing sense of of fluid coming out. And on the rendered animation that follows this, you'll you'll be able to see that. And that's how you make a waterfall. Moving forward from waterfalls to water mills, we're on chapter 5, which we are making a water mill spin. A couple caveats to know about 
Blender's Fluid Simulator, if you haven't already noticed, is that the fluids, when when set, even if you give it an initial velocity, will not cause an object to spin. For instance, if we wanted to make this propeller on our water mill spin, uh, set that in there. If we wanted to make this propeller here spin uh, by pushing the water across it, the force of the water isn't going to make it spin in this direction. It's just it, the fluid simulator doesn't currently work like that. It doesn't have an, an effect on obstacles like that currently. So what you have to do is you have to do a little bit of fakery and trickery to make it look like that. And in order to do that, I'll show you the process by which you want to do. So we have our basic scene set here. We have our house, ground, and our water mill propeller. All of them are modeled and set as obstacles. The propeller itself we've set as an obstacle with shell simply because the fins on it tend to, at that thinness uh, of size, they tend to give uh, the fluid simulator a little problem and it sometimes doesn't recognize it. So I've set it to shell because for, for these purposes it's going to work out just fine. The other thing to note is that this particular mill is actually made up, this propeller is made up of separate components that I've joined together afterwards. Um, you could technically have these as separate objects, each of the fins is a separate object, and then use a parent uh, relationship to constrain the rotation for it, but the fluid simulator tends to prefer it better when, uh, when it's all one object. Um, we also set our ground to be an obstacle. And of course, we don't want water flowing into our house, so we set that as an obstacle as well. Now the next thing we need to do is actually make our propeller spin. So, split this area here and break up our, our IPO curve editor. We're going to set our first keyframe here at rotation there. And then, around frame 20, We'll set another rotation. Then we're going to rotate this in the around the x-axis. So we're going to rotate around the x-axis, and we're going to push that about 30 degrees. You can see the size is spinning is rotating right there, and so we're going to rotate this with the water. That's the direction we want it to go. So we're going to go negative 30 degrees. Then we'll set another keyframe. Now that we have that moving the way we want it to, all we really have to do now, we want to extrapolate that data so it goes all the way in that direction. We don't really need these other two rotation lines, so we can just get rid of those. But this particular one, we want that curve to be extended through extrapolation. So now, when we hit Alt-A, it spins as we want it to. So we have our spinning water mill that's set as an obstacle and working well. Now we need, of course, we need our domain. Let me join this back here because we'll, we don't need this right now. So we have our we have that set up and we need our domain object, which I've already set up as a cube. Gave it a blue fluid material, as you can see here. Um, there's Suzanne's head as it pulls it up. Gave it blue, similar to the the same material used in the waterfall and in the sink. It's just blue because we like blue it on this particular one. So go back to our physics buttons. This will be our domain. Uh, our final resolution. We're going to bake this at, at 210, but for some display purposes, I'm going to run this at 70. Of course, 96 frames, 24 frames a second. Our end time is going to be 4 seconds. And we're going to set our simulation data to go to be chapter 5. Alright, so select that as our directory. We have our simulation position going on there. No, nothing much different going on in here. We did max out the real world size to being 10 meters because that's pretty close to what we're going to want. And uh, we have a few tracer particles that we put in, but I'm going to zero this out for now, and we'll get we'll make use of it later. All right. So let me hide that back out. We have our domain. We have our propeller 
and we have our, our basic water mill scene. Of course, what we need now is our fluid. When we have this, this is what I set up as our initial fluid. And basically, you just set that as a fluid and knit it by volume. Don't give it any sort of velocity, and let that be our starting point. Now, when you bake this, I'm going to hide our fluid source layer there so it's not in our way when we see the baking. When we bake this, we'll see the propeller, make sure that our propeller is, is interacting with the fluid and scooping it up. So when we hit bake, we should see that happen just well as it initializes itself. You see it gets caught up in there and you see it's already deflected it's held within the boundaries of the ground and the uh, it stops here and here because that's the boundaries of our domain and it's not interacting uh, not intersecting with anything it's actually being moved and pushed around by our our uh, our pieces here so we'll let this cook and I will get back when it's done all right, with the simulation done, we'll start we'll just run it when play it. And you'll notice our propeller here will lift up our water. And of course, it's all choppy because our resolution is relatively low. Um but one of the other things you'll start to notice is that it's still very static. You know, you basically have a propeller spinning and a static fluid. So, technically, our our water mill should be moving the ground this way, which is not what we want it, want to be happening here. We want our our fluid to be flowing this way, and it to be actually look like it's pushing our propeller around, which it obviously is not doing. So we have to do a couple steps to fix that. First things first that we want to do is take our original fluid this fluid that we had set here is obviously not doing what we want it to do so what we're going to do is we're going to edit it we're going to cut a line here and cut a line here split this off so we have we'll have actually three boxes like so but let me go back first here and disable this All right. now we have our new fluid items we're going to break it up into three sections. First, we have our inflow object, which has a fairly low for the for the real for the world size uh, y force of one and a quarter, pushing in this way, pushing in the y direction. So we should get that flow in working properly the way we want it to. Then we have our main fluid body, which isn't going to do anything except for be pushed by our fluids here and then our last one is going to be an outflow so we have our inflow pushing in our fluid and then our fluid pushes into our outflow so it should look like a steady stream of liquid going this way the main reason for putting the fluid objects here or this particular fluid object here is so you don't have to wait for the entire thing to fill up we have our our object here alright so we have our object here uh, our fluid main fluid object, our inflow and our outflow. Putting that into our scene, it looks like so. So now we should have our fluid pushing through this way. If we run our simulation, we'll hide this back again. Let's put this so we can actually see it a little bit more nicely. We should start to see when it simulates this flow pushing this way. On our, on our fluid simulation. We'll bake the simulation and see what it looks like. And of course this is going to take a bit so let's uh, pause. Alright so it's simulated and you can already tell from this particular still that it's, that it's more turbulent and when we hit play we get more of that you know chunk of the river feeling. We feel the water pushing through and it gets more of what we want it to do and of course it ends here so it doesn't pile up like uh, in a way we don't want it to it just goes through and, and leaves and now it looks like our fluid is actually pushing around our our water mill propeller now there's a couple other things we can do to heighten the realism on the entire thing you know, also notice that it, it bunches up a bit back here 
and goes onto the embankment, but it do that does happen on real water mills, and for the camera angle we've chosen, uh, you don't really see that much anyway, so we're not too concerned about that, but we do get this going on, and we really want to heighten this and get this to look more real. So, we do a couple things. First and foremost, on uh, almost everything happens for this in our uh, our domain, and so first and foremost, the most e most easy thing to do is increase our resolution to 210. Then we don't have to mess with anything here because we're already set. All but we can add our tracer particles. Uh, what I want to do is I want to put this at 0.5 rather than one. As you can see in the tooltip here, um, zero is off, one is normal, and more than more than one is a lot more particles. What happens though is when you run it at one particles tend to go all over the place and it makes it look like basically the river exploded on a water mill which we don't want we just want enough particles for it to feel like it's streaming off the edge here when the water mill spins around so about 0.5 works fairly well and of course to get the right number of particles happening we just set our increase our surface subdivision to 2 and that should handle most of our needs on that regard so we have our, our river flowing through, we have our spin, and it's at a good rate too, so it looks it looks like it's a rate that's believable for spinning our water mill at about 30 degrees every second. So now, now that we have that, we'll go ahead and run our simulation by baking. And of course, because we set all these extra attributes in here, the bake is going to take a lot longer. Uh, so we're definitely going to pause and I'll be back as soon as it's done. Okay, so this has been rendered and now you can see we have even about halfway through the animation we have a really nice breaking up. It breaks up just along the edges. It has the, the particle tracers where we want them to be. They're not spraying all over the place and it works very, very well. Of course, with this there's just one other thing just like all the other ones we've been doing that can give us that last little touch that we're looking for. So we, that's of course motion blur. And we do that simply by going in here to our node editor. We go there. In our compositor nodes, same setup as before. Have our vector blur coming in from uh, image Z and speed pushing out to that and that will render it out and you'll have a nice little animated uh, water mill that's being pushed by our inflow to our outflow and that is how you simulate being pushed around by fluids So we've been taking some time here and doing some things on a larger scale. Let's do a really quick one for a little bit of fun. We're going to splash a logo. This is chapter 6, by the way. Here we have our standard CMI VFX logo. And we're going to throw a big ball of liquid at it. So the setup for this is pretty much standard. This, also, this works very well for uh, logo spots or end of a commercial or that sort of stuff. So... I've taken the logo, which originally originally was in a vector format, and I've imported it through Blender's import function. You can import uh, paths, SVGs, PostScript, EPS, uh, Adobe Illustrator. You can even import GIMP paths, which is really nice. So I, I imported this actually from from a EPS file, if I recall correctly. And the first thing I did is I actually create. Uh, when you import it, you can set the depth and set the bevel on it. Once you've done that, the next step to do that, the next step you want to do is convert it into a mesh because the fluid simulator only recognizes meshes, it doesn't recognize curve objects. So that's simply done with a uh, with a keyboard shortcut and now when you look at it, we now have ourselves a nice little mesh of the entire logo. Not the cleanest of meshes, but it serves our purposes for this. So that's our, our logo that we're splashing. So we're going to enable that as an obstacle. We don't want the liquid to stick to it, so we're going to set that to free. And because it's closed surfaces, we set this to init volume. Then we have a wall that we're going to splat our liquid against. So we just enable that. 
also is an obstacle, also is free, and because we set that up as a cube, we knit that to a volume as well. Then, we take our fluid object, we just made an icosphere, stretched, stretched it out, and placed it in where we wanted it, enable that, just a fluid with a volume in it, and playing with the, with the velocities, um, we're using our global coordinate, so we're going to put it negative one and a half on the x-axis, and negative, uh, sorry, one and a half on the y-axis, and actually give it a little bit of an up value on the z. So it gives us a little bit of an arc coming in. And this will happen in our domain, which is on this layer. And notice that this is not a cubicle, or yeah, a cubicle domain is actually uh, non-even sided. What happens is when you set this as your domain and set the real world size, the real world size is again the size of the longest side of the domain. And I just set it like this so that we could have enough space to throw things around in here. And of course this is set, it, set as our domain, regular gravity, real world size of about a meter. And for this initially we're going to have none of our boundary options set and set the initial resolution to 7. This is 24 frames a second and we're only going to run this for 48 frames so we're looking at uh, 2 seconds for our simulation time and we need to set our directory for our simulation which goes in here under chapter 6 sim alright select this as our directory and now we're gonna splash it and the way you the easiest way to do this is to set this up with a low velocity or sorry a low resolution like 50 so that when you run the simulation and we're actually gonna do this from outside of the the view here so you can actually see it when you run the simulation it'll go pretty quickly and you can get a good idea of your trajectory and because it's really re low resolution it happens very quickly so then what you can do is you can play this back and watch it splatter and in this case we had it set up where we wanted to if we wanted to have it a little bit lower we could lower our z-force uh, here if we wanted to hit higher if we wanted to hit further to the left or right you could actually adjust this the way to have it work there and in this particular case, I like it hitting right there over the sea, so I I played with it ahead of time and uh, got it the, traje the trajectory the way I wanted it. So now we can again we can play it and get the right behavior, and again it's going to hit the wall and splatter out. Now comes the fun part of making it look really more dynamic. There's two ways to do this. You can uh, obviously, if we hit escape here, select our domain. Best thing to do. To pump that resolution all the way up. And because we're not using an inflow, we have a lot more flexibility as to how much memory, system memory, we can take advantage of for doing these simulations. In this case, normally with an inflow, if you're doing uh, just a resolution of 250, you're already over a gig and a half. But just because you, but because we're using just a fluid, uh, we can get up to a resolution of 300, and we're only we're, we're still less than a gig for for simulation memory. So once you set that, and again. Um, the other thing I'll set on here is increasing our surface subdivision. Not no particles or tracers. You just want to have it a nice little cohesive splatter across the the logo itself. So you set that, and you let it bake. And of course, because of the higher resolution and because of our surface subdivision, it's actually going to take quite a bit longer. But not necessarily as long as some of our four-second simulations took. And since it's going to take a while, I'm going to pause and we'll be back when it's finished. Now our simulation is complete and you can see we have a lot more little splatter things going on here which makes it look a lot nicer. You can see it came out and our blob just comes right into the screen, hits our, our logo and just drips right away. Just a nice little stinger that you would want to have for you know putting a logo at the end of a commercial again or or even a uh, a, a film open or something or in this case a demonstration now we could make this yet more dynamic and of course what am I talking about I'm talking about particles so 
you would throw in, you know, 25, say, just say 10 tracer particles. Um, this one, we want to keep the particles cohesive. We don't want it exploding all violent and crazy off of it. So, just say 0.25. And, of course, keep the surface subdivision and everything the same. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to a, a different simulation director, directory. We'll just call this sim2. Select that as our directory. And now we have, again, a whole new slate to play with. And now that we have this, we can bake it. Now again, because we're using particles, it should take longer than average, longer than without to render, but it shouldn't take a whole lot more since we already set our our surface subdivisions to two for the last render. So this should take around the same amount of time. All right, and we'll go ahead and bake this. And again, because of the time, when it gets back, we'll get back. Okay, it's done simulating, and now you can see when it hits it's a lot you have a lot more of those little bumpies and particles flopping around which is really cool looking in my, my personal opinion so I, I kinda prefer this look to the other one but you know it depends on on what the client needs and what they want for that sort of splatter action and of course just like all the other ones the one thing that can really set this uh, set this apart and make it you know, make it look finished is motion blur. So again, I have a node set up in the node editor under our compositor nodes. And the same standard deal. Running out and this will create our uh, motion blurred logo splash force. And again you could do that for this particular target or by simply retargeting to our older simulation you can use this one. Either one works perfectly alright. So, that's pretty much it. I'm going to set this back to the other one because it's still my favorite. Yeah, it takes a second for it to load because of the particles, but man, that looks cool. Alright, so with that done, we'll go on to the next chapter. Now we come to the part we've all been waiting for. Whenever someone talks about fluid simulation, everybody thinks of at least one thing that they've wanted to do at least once. And that is destroying a city. Everybody enjoys city destruction. And I'm no exception, so that's what we're going to do right now. So, first things first, we have our mock city set up here. Uh, in production, you'd probably want to use something definitely a bit more... Uh, advanced, but these also serve well for proxies um, for better models. It really depends on how close your shots are. Each of these are set to a shell init free obstacle, and the ground itself is also a well, it's a volume init free obstacle. Then we have our domain, which is already set there to be the size of the entire city. I have a resolution right now set to 70, and gravity is the same. Real world size is maxed out uh, at 10 meters. Now, granted, the city is larger than 10 meters, but because this is the the current uh, topmost size for our uh, simulator, we have to make some accommodations to make it look a little bit better. And then for this particular setup right now, I have nothing really special going on as far as tracers and particles go. All right. Now we also need to select our destination directory, which we'll choose this one for chapter seven. Now, when you first do a, whenever you want to destroy a city, the uh, the first initial idea would be to have a fluid as an inflow that would just push water right on in, which is what we have here. This is going to be our fluid object set to an inflow with an x value because it's going across the x-axis uh, of negative 1.2 and we want it to we have the ground level like this so we hope that it actually flows up and does what you would expect a, a wave crashing into a city would do so based on that we have this set together 
we can hide this layer again, show our domain, select it, and bake it. Now as this begins to bake, you'll start to see the water does actually flow up, but because it's an even force across the x-axis, you're not quite getting that, that undercurrent of, of wave that you're looking for here. We're sitting here nearly, nearly a second into the animation, and you get the wave coming in, but it doesn't give you quite the effect you're looking, we're looking for here, because you don't have, I mean, this kind of works for a tsunami, but one, our water level up here is a bit too high, and two, you don't have that crashing wave that you want. So, depending on what you're looking for, this may or may not serve you. For me, I'd like to have something a little bit more turbulent, I'd like to have a little bit more of a wave shape coming through as water invades our city, which you can actually see working really well. It's made its way to the first block and is uh, giving us nice sets of turbulence and things here. And of course, increasing the resolution definitely helps that. But, let's try and alleviate that, that wave problem a little bit. We want to get a sort of a spinning turbulence thing going on here. So, I'm going to ex escape out of this, this simulation. Now, for all intents and purposes, this works really well and comes out and with some uh, tracer particles and whatnot added to it. This is perfectly adequate for, for like a, a tidal wave coming in or like a tsunami force deal coming in, overcoming our city. But let's try and get something that, that curves with us a little bit more here. And in order to do that, we are going to use a slightly different setup. I'm going to take this and disable our fluid there. And I have another little setup here. Looks a little bit weirder. Using the same basic object here for our inflow, but we have something a little bit different. We're going to take this object right here, which is just a, a, a scaled and extruded a bit. We're going to enable that, and we're going to use this as another inflow object. But whereas this one was going in the x direction, this one is going also in the x direction, but the opposite way. And it's feeding itself right into this, which we've set up as an outflow object. Now, it the reason for doing that is that this automatically creates a spinning little turbulence thing that, that we're looking for here that should theoretically create our wave for us. So we have these initialized and ready to go. So we can go back to our city layer. I'm going to put this to the side so we can get a good view of what's going to happen here. Grab our domain. Let's pull this back a bit and bake it. Now, because we're using another inflow and an outflow, this will also increase our bake time a bit, but it shouldn't make it too, too horrible. And I can't talk a little bit while it goes on. Now you see, this is our fluid. You see it's pushing this way, and it runs into our outflow. And now you have that wave, that one little crash over. Now it might not get as far out as we might want it to, but it gives us the crashing lifting sensation that we're really, really looking for in this. And that's more of what we're looking for in this particular wave. Now what we want to do is actually increase our our uh, render time. Not our render time. <laughs> We're going to be doing that too, but we want to increase our resolution on our domain. So let me uh, escape out of this. Alright, and you can see this is what we're, what we're really looking for here. And it'll be far more apparent at a higher resolution. But it comes over and crashes. It'll give us the really good attack into the city. And so we go in, set this to 210, and under our advanced tab, this does nothing changes. But here we're going to add um, some tracer particles. Now I've done this before at 30, I've done it at 10, I've done it at 2000, and you have to play with the settings to see what works best for you. Um, right now I'm going to set this at 1000. I'm going to set particles to generate. I want to have a little bit more than average particle setup, so I want to set that to 2 on here, and I'm going to increase our service subdivision. Now if we want really, really nice, we can set this to 3, and that will really help our, our final render. Um, I'm going to actually drop this down and put this down to 30 just for these render times, but on the final, on the final render that you'll see after, after this, uh, this part of this chapter of the tutorial, you, sh you should see a really nice, nice moving animation. So we have this set there, ready to cook, and We'll let it bake. Now this one again, because it has all the, all of the uh, 
particle settings and everything amped up on it, plus the resolution setting amped up on it, it will take a, a quite a bit longer for it to render. So I'm going to pause out and come back when it's done. Now that the rendering has been done, we have a little spill off on the back, but that's not such a big deal. We have our particle wave coming through here. And you get these really nice little broken up pieces down in there, which is really fun. And of course, with, with a greater particle count, that should increase a whole lot more to get a better feel for it, especially once it gets to be in about a second and it actually hits the city, you get these the setup all across there, which is really, really nice. So that's basically how we go about destroying a city. And again, with enough velocity, it blows right on through, but you get these really cool wrapping setups here on where it hits. And of course, motion blur should make this Uh, happen a lot more nicely which we have the same basic setup right here as well and again I kept the blur factor at this one at, at one because that's all that was really necessary to to get the effects that we're looking for here now increasing the particle count would probably do this a bit of a benefit and to help it make it look like it's a a larger wave hitting a, a larger city than than 10 meters so that would be something that would be good for the for the final render here all right and now we'll move on to the next chapter. Chapter 8. Well, now that we've destroyed an entire city worth of people and ruined their, the lives of those therein, Let's uh let's just focus on on ruining a single individual person's life. In fact, we will ruin the life of one man candy. We we'll have to thank uh, Basam Kadali for providing this rig. Uh, he's made it free uh, freely available to anybody in the Blender community. So it's very nice nice of him, and it's a very good rig for us to play with. So we're going to melt the man candy, and so the first thing we we want to do is actually give him a little bit of motion. I want to pull this up a little bit. So, to do that, we'll go ahead and let me split this so we can see our IPO curve editor and pull up his armature, which is here. And I've actually taken the liberty of actually uh, giving him a couple keyframe movements on his arms and his head. So, you can watch it come across and I'll take a look at his left and right hand and take a look back at us and the idea here is that from about that point we're gonna have him just melt away now one of the things to bear in mind for for this well, we're gonna hide this now that we've got him keyframed and ready to go one of the things to bear in mind for this is that fluids and and inflows are currently not controllable by armatures in blender uh, obstacles you can control an obstacle with a with a with an armature and you can export that with the settings here for instance if we were to enable him as a obstacle we could actually export the animated mesh and have him be controlled by the armature Unfortunately, we're using him as a fluid. Currently, the fluids are not controllable by armature, so we're going to have to do a little bit of trickery to get it to transition from one to the next. So, we have his, his keyframe set in there, and we've enabled him as a fluid, and we don't really need to give him any ex explicit forces in any particular direction. We have our floor, which we'll have as an obstacle in it volume, and now the other thing we need to do is to create our domain which I've put on this layer and I've given I've given the domain the same material that the actual man candy is using that's why it's the the orange color there 
and uh, current resolution I set this to is 70 and 4 seconds, 24 frames a second, so it's 96 frames. Viscosity, I want it to main, remain a bit cohesive, so I've, I've kept them at 100, that way he melts out fairly nicely. And I've kept, put the real world sizes at 3 meters, which is should be adequate for him, because he's probably only maybe uh, around 2 meters tall, give or take. Then, under our boundary buttons, we haven't changed anything. we we'll just leave that plain and simple. Then we need to set our simulation location. This is chapter 8. Our directory is set there. And I don't really need to see this very much right now, so I'll just join that back. And now we just bake. Now one of the things also to realize when it's doing the baking here, uh, because the original fluid mesh is a bit more intricate, uh, it's going to take a little bit longer for it to get the initial information and everything put together. And you'll notice this is not as nice of a, uh, not the same resolution that the actual man candy rig is set to. So. And again, again, it's not being controlled by the armature, so the animation isn't adding to it. You also note that from whatever frame we're sitting at, that's the frame that it's going to animate from. So we have a little more work to do on this. So let's cancel this out and get that work done. First and foremost, again, we wanted him to begin his melt uh, right around there. So this is the, whenever we get back to simulating, we need to put them back at this particular frame. Otherwise, it'll do the simulation from whatever the mesh is currently deformed to look like. So we have that set. Now, the timing on it, so we'll just remember frame 45 here. The timing on it is actually not so bad. It drops fairly quickly and splatters out. But in order to, to get it to look right, you really have to amp up the, the resolution on this. Fortunately for us, the, uh, the character itself works nicely in this regard. And since it's just a fluid, we can really pump up our simulation time, or our resol resolution. Now, of course, here it's 2.5 gigs worth of space. If we were to pump this down to 210, it works a little bit a little bit more nicely for, for what our needs are. And then, from this point, we'll just make, again, we want to make sure that we're starting around the proper frame. And what I'm also going to do is, I'm since we've increased our resolution, I'm also going to pump up our, our surface subdivision size here. And with those settings put together, we should have ourselves a fairly nice little little look here. So we'll start ahead and go ahead and bake that. And again, because of all the settings we've put into it and, and the armature and all that stuff, it's going to take quite a bit more time to render out. So we're going to pause while it bakes these fluids for us. All right, we're back from baking. And couple quick changes I did in here. I actually lowered the resolution down to 190 and I decided that I'd rather have it running at frame 27 than uh, the frame 45 we had originally decided on. So what it looks like now, the first thing you'll notice is that he still stays there but the mesh doesn't. So what you want to do is you're gonna, obviously going to want to hide him. And so now we just have this. Now we have our melting man candy. Now we combine this with some motion blur, which I've already set up. And we get a fairly nice looking render here. Now the thing is you want to be able to do this 
and mix the two pieces together. So in order to get it to look like he's going from this state at frame 27 to the next state of being melted, basically what needs to be done is we need to animate him at least up in the frame, I'd say at least up to frame 35 depending on the length of the transition and then use that as a use your a compositor app or a morph tool or so a uh, another application to merge from this particular uh, animation to this one and that will give us our final rendered animation that looks like our man candy has melted and fallen down Oh, this is chapter nine. It seems our friend the man candy just can't get a good day or get a break at all because because today or at this particular tutorial, he's gonna get splashed in the face by a bypassing vehicle. Poor man candy now one thing you might notice from this particular frame back here is or any of these frames for that matter is that the fluid actually adheres to him as he's rigged that is to say that while like for instance in the, in the last chapter fluids and inflows are not controllable by armatures obstacles on the other hand are controllable by, by armatures and you just do that by simply using the animated mesh and pressing the export button as an obstacle on him now we'll show you the process by which we want to have him be affected by this wave or by this the splash. So the first thing you want to do is, well, first thing we're going to do right now is we're going to take his current armature and let me put this back down to zero here so we can see what's going on. We're going to take this armature which has all the actions on it. I'm going to set this and I'm going to make this a single user so it has an empty set of actions here. So now as it splashes forward, he is entirely immobile. Um, now, we have this set. The first thing you want to do is you want to take your domain setup here, which this is the domain. If you put this in edit mode, you'll see uh, that it actually covers the entirety of, of the space there. Let's hide the armature again. And it covers his entire space there and we set it with a real world settings we rendered it at a resolution of 200 we're going to do a test render right here at 100 at half that this is a four second animation 24 frames a second so it's 96 frames um, we set the real world size just like in the last uh, last chapter set it to three meters to cover his entire space and when we rendered this particular one out uh, we had 10 tracer particles and 0.1 uh, on the particle generation so they would stay kind of stuck together the way they were right now for the for this particular pro step in the process we don't need any of that set there then we need our fluid object which is sitting ever so nicely if we hide that our fluid object here Is right there and it's not an inflow or anything special like that it's just an, a shell in it uh, it has a negative x value of one a y pushing it this way at one and a half and then a heavy z force at four and a half to get it up into his face and that's all that's necessa necessary for that now we take this flu our domain and I'm going to retarget our baking to something the previous simulation that I had set up I'd actually baked it at a lower resolution at the 100 
without any animation on them. So what happens is you get a good idea of the timing. Let's hide this layer here. You get a good idea of his timing. It splashes into him and falls down. So now we can sit here and go, okay, the water's coming up. And it's going to splash him right there. So we want him to react right around there. All you have to do is go in, activate his armature. Say we want this frame for him to start doing his action. We say insert a location and rotation keyframe for that particular bone. And then say he's going to react. And by that point, he should have already stepped all the way back. So we just grab it and set him back, have his knees bent a little bit. Perhaps give him a bit of a rotation here take his foot, grab it and put it back, rotate it out, and give him a good stance on that. We should actually lower this a bit. And you basically you go through and you set your keyframes as using your low resolution fluid simulation as a reference so that by the time you finish that you will have your keyframes look like so. So now, when the water comes up, he puts his hands up. Now, granted, this is still this isn't reacting to his hand; it's reacting to the last simulation we had of him moving, uh, with him not moving. That is. So what we had is the old fluid sim, but now we have the properly timed his properly timed action now that we have his properly timed action set in here then we can go back grab our domain set a resolution to 200 and turn up all of our tracer particles the particle generation settings that we've decided to be wanted and turn up our surface subdivision now that we have that set we go in and you simply press bake bake the fluids in and when you bake the fluids what ends up happening is what you saw at the beginning of this tutorial uh, this particular chapter is a simulation which granted has a lot more in it let's turn off this widget hide our armature and now we have a fluid that splashes into him and reacts to his body as it properly should and of course we would always want to, we've, since we've been doing it on just about every other one so far, put our node editor in here, and we have our vector blur. So when it splashes into him and we animate it, we'll have a nice blurry splash that runs into the magic man and ruins his day yet again. Chapter 10, The Exploding Bathtub. Alright, so in this particular one, what we're going to do is we're going to blast water out of our tub. Um, this, this is a, a tub that's been possessed. <laughs> so, got a little bit preset done here. I have established a ceiling for my room. Well, first, first and foremost, we have our tub, which is enabled as an obstacle, and we set it to free, so it performs properly. One of the other things you might want to note is that the model that I had gotten here looked like so as a, as a single unit. Now the interesting thing about that is that these are separate. One of the things about Blender's Fluid Simulator is that it doesn't tend to like um, obstacles that intersect. So I've actually not even enabled these as obstacles because they're not really uh, easy to see in the shot and I have them separated from the tub itself, which is, as you can see here, a closed surface. So, we have our tub, and then what I did is we set up a our domain, and the domain, if you look at it, is the size of our room, except it's a little bit taller, This, which is why I had put this plane in here for our ceiling. And I set that as an init shell obstacle. Uh, the normal one is pointing downward. The rest of it is mostly there just for show. This is actually not even going to be an obstacle because it's right along the same sides 
as the domain, but it's there to close the room so we can have uh, four walls for our shot. Going back to our domain, I selected, you'll see I'm going to start off playing with this at a resolution of 70. Uh, the simulation time on this is uh, actually, that's one of the interesting things about it. We want the water to come out and, and look like it's blasting out, but to give it more of a dramatic effect, we're going to do it in slow motion. So the actual timeline we have here is at 24 frames a second, and so we have 96 frames. So the entire simulation itself is going to run when it's finally played back at 4 seconds, but our simulation time, we're going to end it at 2. So it should look like it's going at about half speed. Uh, which should give us some really interesting, nice effect there. So we have that set up like that. Then under advanced, we set the real world size of the room to be about 3 meters. And that's the only thing that's necessary there, the same gravity, same water. And then we also, for the final render, we're going to throw in some our, our particles and setups. But for an initial test, we'll run this back down to 0 real quick. 1. Or sorry, zero. And this one sets to one. All right, so we have our domain set up for our for our first test on this run, except for picking a directory for it, which will be right here. We'll just call it Chapter Ten Dash Sim. Select that directory, and so we have the, everything here set up, we just need our fluid. All right, so we choose our fluid, which is in here. I'm going to hide our domain so we can see this back in our shaded view. I've set up a fluid here, which basically is taking the inside of our tub here and using that, I've separated that and created that as our fluid, and then I scaled it down, which is what this particular piece is. And of course, I, I topped it off. One of the other things to note is that this, notice that the top of this is squared off. You can close the surface of this by selecting this um, this edge loop and scaling, uh, extruding it and scaling it to a single point, but the fluid simu simulator tends to like closed surfaces that are that are nicer than that for for doing obstacles and for doing fluids for that matter. So we've set it up like that. Now Enabling this as our fluid, we set it, we want the fluid to go up, so we set our Z force to five, and it's ready to go up. The other thing is, we're going to count on it being a source of fluid, so it's just going to be a single fluid going straight up. And this is the shot that we're looking to do. We're just going to blast it right on up. So we go back and hide that layer, turn on our domain layer. And with everything set here, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and bake this and see what it looks like. The simulation runs a lot quicker. The problem, of course, is that it, it's not very dramatic. I and mean, even if we threw some particles on there, it's just, it's it's a chunk of water flying up in the air. It doesn't really give us a whole lot of well anything. So we have to accommodate for that. Because we want to look like this this tub has actually got water blasted out of it and making it look a lot cooler. Well, so this 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 obviously isn't going to work for us. We need to find a new methodology. So although the splatter down here looks pretty nice, it's not what we're looking for. So let's escape out of this and try and think about taking a different tack. We'll go back, choose our fluid. Well, First things first, let's set it as an inflow rather than a fluid. That way we have more water, more liquid coming out. Let's see how that treats us. So we have that set as our inflow. And of course, using this as an inflow is going to give us more uh, more calculation time because it has more geometry it has to deal with. But I think it'll be worthwhile. So we have this. Put this back to our shot. And let's bake it with an inflow. Well, with an inflow, it looks better. Uh, of course, it's going to be affected by gravity when it starts coming back down. 
But we have two other problems with using it as an inflow. One, because of the size that we chose for it, I mean, I could scale it up a little bit, but it, it kind of, it's not running at the, usually when you see this, it, the water runs up the edges of the side of our tub there. This is obviously not doing this. This is almost like a, a tub is blasting water out of it in a, in a laser-like form, which is, well, interesting, not necessarily what we're looking for. So, well, it looks nicely, you know, coming down. We have we have partially what we want, but the other problem beyond the fact that uh, geometry coming out, the the other problem is that it's not stopping. You know, for the entire two seconds, we're going to be blasting water out, or for the entire four second simulation or two second simulation time, we're going to be blasting water out, and well, as you can see, it's going to fill at this at this rate that we're filling the room. It's going to fill up the room really quickly. So that's another consideration we need to take in, take into into mind, and we'll we'll need to address that. There's two ways to take care of this. So I'm going to let this cook just a little bit longer, just to get an idea here. Well, that's no, that's good. All right, all right. So we have this, and it looks, you know, at the very least, it looks interesting. And it gets us that that idea. We could probably go with having a little bit more force. If we're going to stick with this streaming upward deal, we could probably go with a little bit more force to do that. So so it would actually go up and strike the ceiling and come back down. But again, it's a lot of fluid coming out, and we'd have to find a way to cut that off. So the first way we'd want to do that is we want to split this area and break open our IPO curve editor. And let's change our rotation here. Select our fluid object. We have an inflow and in a volume, but what we want to do is we want to cut the, cut it off at some point. We want to have it so it's no longer just spewing fluids out. So one of the things that Blender can do is you can actually set animation IPO curves using the fluid simulator, and I've actually gone ahead and done that. Have that here. I have an IPO that I've already set up. And this basically is an IPO on the active curve, basically enabling or not enabling the fluid. This is going to be our cutoff. So we're going to blast up to frame 10, and then it's going to peter off a bit so that it'll go up, splash out, and be done. Because if we were just going to deal with a simple amount of fluid, the other thing is that we're not blasting water out of it. The idea is to make it look like the amount of water that was in there was a lot of water, but it's shooting all out. So we're using an inflow to get the better motion, but we need to cut the inflow off. This is the curve that we can use to do that. And I set this up. We can actually rotate this and, and play with it a bit, but I set it so it would blast and then go right on off, which is strange to do for a binary setting, but it seems to work rather well. So we have this and our cutoff coming here. Now, the other thing that we really want to do is we want it to come along the edges of the, of the of the tub here. So rather than shoot it up, we're going to take our fluid and we're going to shoot it down. And we'll shoot it down really hard. So this is going to be an even more important factor now. So we're going to blast this at negative 10 into the tub. And what will happen is the liquid will roll across the edges of the tub and shoot up outside of it, which gives us a little bit more of a dramatic effect there. So let me hide our layer there. Grab this and bake it. Now, of course, since we have greater force and everything, it's going to take a little bit longer, but not a, not an egregious amount of time. But you see, it already comes down, goes across the edges, and it shoots right on out. And this is more of what we are looking for, at least what we wanted with this particular shot. Now you see it intersect with the side of the tub here. That's mostly due to the resolution. At a higher resolution, this doesn't happen. And we're at this point, we're doing it to get the motion right anyway, to get it to look right. So we're going to let this finish baking, and I'll be back. All right, so the simulation's complete. And just another note on here, if we wanted to actually simulate this at this lower resolution, the way to handle this would be the same way we did in chapter 2 with the sink is to put a proxy object in here to serve as our obstacle this will keep this from from cutting out and and working working that way 
part of the reason for it is that we set this up as a volume init and there are parts on our on our tub here that are kind of thin especially for for a higher for a low resolution simulation data that's why it breaks through but because we're running at a higher resolution we can go ahead and use it just fine the important thing to note here is that following our timeline here our fluid spewed out and by this point in time it's it's no longer and my walls in the way here it's no longer pushing this fluid out because it's cut off on the uh, on our inflow object so as it comes across here you'll notice that the tub may be filled but there's nothing else coming out of it which is what we wanted for this effect now the, of course, of course, the next thing that we want to do is actually render this out at a higher resolution to to get more of the effect we're looking for in this particular shot, and also so it doesn't intersect there. So, and of course, you want to have a lot of particle tracers because, well, they they make it a lot of fun. So we go back and I'll select our domain object, punch this up to 175. Now, because of the amount of force we're pushing in here and the amount of geometry, you're really reduced with the amount of, uh, well, not reduced, you very much increase the amount of bake memory that's going to be necessary for actually baking out the simulation. So I set this to 175 and it ends up looking pretty good. Uh, that all stays the same. We go back and set our tracer particles to 10, 1, and 2. And with that set, we'll go ahead and bake this and show our final animation. Of course, this will take a little bit of time, so we're definitely going to pause. So, uh, we have a lot of fluid coming out here, and this is what, what happens when we have our, our inflow pushing at the higher resolution with all of our particles. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm going to change this just one frame in one direction. Looking at it, wait, wait for it. <laughs> because there's so much data going on here, it takes a while for it to load each and every frame just for your own little preview here. There. That's how long it took to load it from, from my particular drive. So it'll it'll take a long time just for, for just to blow your mind a little bit. This right here, yeah that's right, that's six point eight gigs of surface simulation data uh to create our our service here. So it'll it'll run down the system just a little bit but the results really really nice plus when we add in our uh, node editor compositor node uh, motion blur gives us a really nice effect which you'll see in this animation at the end of this chapter and now we'll move on to the next Time for another quick little logo uh, example. So this is chapter 11. We're going to fill a logo with molten fluid. Actually, I can come back here, which is what I should have done initially, and just hit play. I'm going to fill the logo let it settle and there you have it now how does this get done fairly easily actually so basically you're going to use all the pr same principles we used in the last tutorial on the tub but we're going to use it to fill out this logo first though we need to have our mold so hiding our domain Basically, we take our logo that was from our original uh, vector drawing or EPS file. We import it, and when you import the curve, you set it up and you export so you have your empty faces here. So you want to, you don't want it to be closed. You want to have it so it's a shell, so that when you edit, when you if you select it and you put it in edit mode, it looks similar to this. So now we have our shell, which we enable as our obstacle. 
with shell. Um, if you have any beveling, it'd be, it would pay to take it off. What I actually went in is on here, there's those curves for the beveling. Now on the bottom it works out just fine, but for the top of it, it can, it can cause an issue uh, for blocking in your fluid. So what I would usually do is I just delete that right off. So it ends up looking like so. Then we have our fluid sources parked above it. And these are just your standard uh, icospheres that are going to be set as your fluids. And you give them varying Z forces depending on size and how much they have to fill up. This takes a lot, of, a fair amount of trial and error just to figure out exactly what gets filled. Um, my recommendation would be to uh, run it at a low resolution to get the fall down timing, and then as it fills up, you know exactly, you know about how much fluid goes in, and then from there you can you can play further. The downside, of course, is that at low resolutions you don't get the fine stream coming down so what it'll do is it'll actually just stop at the top and so you actually have to run this at a higher resolution when you when you bake to to get this to work properly um, so we have each of these set as inflow objects with a with varying z forces in the next thing you want to do of course is have your domain set up now the domain setup is is fairly straightforward. We have a resolution of 210 for this for this one. For, it's a four second animation, so it's 96 frames long. And under the advanced tab, we want it to sort of you want to keep its cohesive behavior, so we want to have it fairly viscous. So I set this to honey, which worked out fairly well for us. And we don't have any need for particles or tracers or anything like that. So this, as far as the domain setup, is very straightforward and very easy to do. The key and interesting part of course comes in with these little guys. You split this off here. Oh let me get grab the edge here. There we go. We split this off to our curve editor. You select this particular one. You notice that again just like in the tub we have a IPO set on the active. So at frame 30, where are we at? Frame 37 should cut right on off, right? Right as it hits the last frame here, frame 40, it cuts off and settles. And each of these has a curve for doing that. And the way you set that is, um, like I said, running it at the low resolution to figure out the timing. And then from there, you have to adjust the sizing and make sure it, it pours out right. So each of these has has your your active curve. And of course, the way you you want to add in this curve is is the same way you would do with um, any other curve in in the Apple window that you want to set up. You would, for instance, pull this over here. If we add an icosphere, just for example here, that we have as a inflow object with a, you know, whatever, certain down forces on it. If you set that up, you go under here to your fluid sim, uh, IPO curves, and then we're going to be adjusting the active. So you select your active, and then you would want to, say we want to do it right around frame, frame 30. So we just right click at the one, control right click, sorry, control left click, at that point there. And we can actually go in and explicitly set it. If you put have this in edit mode and press the N key, you have your transform properties properties. And you go in here and we go, okay, this is we want this at frame 35 to be at one. And then say we move forward to frame uh, frame 40, set a new keyframe, and then you can either grab it yourself, place it by hand, or you can actually go in here and actually enter the value that you want. And that's essentially how you want to put in the, the, the curve for that. Now if we were to run the, the simulation on this and actually pour out, actually this isn't even in the domain so it wouldn't do much of anything for us. But that's in a nutshell how that's set. Then the only other really key thing you want to do is get that get the materials to behave and look properly. In order to do that, 
we go into select our domain and I've set up a simple material here just simple just a straight color I use the these two shader settings because we get that background curve but to amp that up a little bit more we want that orange to, to really uh, jump so I actually added a bit more of that with a ramp and then that's all that's there no need for transparency or, or reflectivity on that then you want to give it just a tad of a glow and you would do that of course through our compositor nodes first thing you do when you set up is you set up your render layers we want to have one render layer we don't even need these we only need two render layers one for our background and one for our fluid and all of our lights and everything are actually on both layers so we have our render layer we have our uh, our ground on the this layer here and we have our domain on this layer there then so we go in here and we say okay so render layer one is going to be everything and render layer two is just the fluid. And then going into our compositor nodes under the node editor, we have a setup here. We have render layer one and render layer two. Render layer one again is everything here. Render layer two is set this. So if I were to just re-render this particular layer and calculate it out and generate it for us. Now this of course is using ambient occlusion and a couple other settings to get it to to get the the shadows and and whatnot that we need but AO is pretty much the, the bulk of the heavy lifting there. The problem with the AO of course is that we get some shadows on here and we don't have a glow because these things are supposed to be molten. So that's where the second the second layer actually comes in handy. So we'll let this finish rendering and continue talking in a second. All right. Now, if we wanted a melted cheese logo, we'd be done. But we kind of like we said we want to have this kind of more molted. We want to have it glowing. So this is where the second render layer comes in. And again, this render layer is just our uh our our logo bit here. So if you render that out, again this is this is with AO. It's the same sort of setup. It'll be everything except for the background. Fortunately, because we don't have the background on there, this render time should take quite a bit, a little bit uh, less time to render out. But once you have these two things set up, we'll we'll go on to the next section. Just let this part render out. All right, with that baked out, this is what the that would just finally they look like. So the next step we do is to take that and we run both of these through a vector blur. So we basically do this just like we've done in the other setup. Let me figure out what it's doing here. And we'll run both of these through their, their respective vector blurs. Then for the logo only layer, we have one other little step to do. We're going to blur that out by itself. So what we get, you run that just through a straight Gaussian blur filter at 3, and it ends up looking something like so. If you want to take a look at that straight up it ends up looking like that. Great! Now we want to add, use that as an additive layer to our other section here, which we just do that with the with our mixer node, which we set instead of mix but to add. Add that in, and now we have a nice glowy logo. And animated, looks fairly sweet. Link that back up there. So, that is how you do Molten Logo in Blender. Congratulations! You've made it to the final chapter in this DVD series on Advanced Fluid Dynamics in Blender. 
And what better way to end a series of tutorials than to give a guy a bloody nose, which is exactly what we're going to be doing here. This, uh, this process works well for uh, any sort of oozing sort of fluid. Um, works well for bloody noses, obviously, uh, bullet holes, uh, tears. Uh, this is the basic process you want to go through for doing that. So let's go ahead and get, get started. First things first, we want to enable our face. Right now I'm only using a, a partial face, uh, but we'll enable that as an obstacle. Um, that is, faces typically are, are a bit sticky, so we use that, use the no slip property for that. Then, we want to add our fluid object. In this particular case, I'm, I've put an icosphere right up in his nostril, and I've closed the back of it so we don't have any back spill behind here. Now, when you enable that fluid, just a volume inflow, and I've given it a small z force of uh, negative 0.1. The reason why it's so small, of course, is because our domain is has a real world size of 0.3 meters, which is just about a foot, which is actually a little bit it's, it's a bit bigger than an average sized head. But uh, we're gonna imagine this guy has a is a large head. So we have our real, our real world side. We also set the viscosity of this to be more like honey. We want a, a kind of a thick viscosity going on in his face. This is a four second animation, four second simulation. Uh, I've set the initial one resolution to 70 on his head. And of course, because his blood, when, unless we're doing you know arterial splatter coming out of his nose, or uh, maybe if the there was a cut on his jugular vein down here, we could change this to do particles and. Uh, increase our um, initial velocity on our, on our uh, fluid material, but since this is going to be oozing, we have these particular settings where we don't need any of that. Now we actually need to pick our simulation directory, which we'll just set this to being chapter 12 dash sim. Select this directory. Now we have our our basic setup all put together. Put this in shaded mode, and so we can see it. And go ahead and let this bake. Now, of course, it takes some tweaking and settings to make sure the set settings tweaking to make sure it behaves properly. Now, the other issue you run into is that lower resolutions, like 70, um, your fluid might actually get caught up in here and and not get in there simply because as you can see here, the fluid's not flush up against the 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 shell of our obstacle, which t tends to happen on our on our lowered fluids. And if you have that sort of situation all the way around, it actually gives you a closed in the surface, and your fluid ends up being trapped, as it seems to be right now. But perhaps it might break its way out, because we also remember we kept this at a fairly viscous, fairly viscous setting so it would take a, a bit for it to pull up and come out anyway. Oh, there it goes. The big the biggest reason for running this at the low resolution is to make sure that the flow is is the way you want it to be. Um because of the force I've put on it, um I've got his flow, I'm gonna have it come right down his face. With a little bit lower force and if I actually adjusted the geometry on the face I could probably get it to flow across this way. But I wanted it to, to run down the front of his face, which matches the geometry of his face anymore, because uh, this particular character is kind of uh, Muppet-mouthed. But again, since you're running at a low resolution, you're not going to get an exact idea of the way it flows out. But you should get an idea of a bit of the timing and the motion of, of what to expect. And where it's going to be at a particular frame. Like I know by looking at it right now at almost uh, three seconds it's going to be coming right across the top of his lip here and then pro so probably by the end of it it'll be pouring right down by his chin but because it breaks apart from the low resolution we don't get to see that very well And again, this works well for 
for if this was an eye and a tear duct, the same basic process. You might not want to use an icosphere in that case. You may want to use something that matches the geometry a little bit more as your as your fluid source, and go from there. Also, if you want it to cut off or you want it to well up, tear, and then slow down, and then do that, you could use the uh, fluid ipo curves that we used in the last two tutorials. So we have this simulated. You can see it run out. It comes down. And at this point, you only have a vague notion of how far it's going to come out because, I mean, the, the simulation at this resolution just doesn't work out. So we're going to run this straight up at the higher resolution. Of course, it's going to increase our bake memory, but we're willing to accept that. And it should also run more aligned to the face. So let's go ahead and bake that. And because this is going to take longer, we're going to pause after, the, after I hit this and uh, come back when it's finished baking for us. So we've completed baking and at frame 94 it definitely did run all the way down his face and we have a really nice flow going here for someone who apparently really got punched in the face so he's he's bleeding quite a fair amount here but with these settings put in we have a um a nice way of running this and because the ge there's not a whole lot of geometry going on here, even at a resolution of 200, this actually gives us a pretty decent estimation of, of the timing of this is going to flow out at. All right. Well, thank you so much for paying attention to to these tutorials, and hopefully they've they've helped you make a lot of things where you can go about punching people in the nose virtually destroying cities virtually splashing people with your with a with a car and uh making your toilets and bathtubs explode